And uh, I, I really not, don't know whether I fit here because I don't really do neurodegeneration myself, but maybe I can introduce to um, the use of Drosophila and the use also of uh, reassess to look at neurodegeneration and their development. And that's why I'm going to start. Actually, when I read the booklet yesterday, I realized that many of you already do Drosophila. I had prepared something which was very broad on Drosophila, then I eliminated all those slides, and then this will allow me to go further in the introduction of my talk. And uh, I know that five people used to have a very specific jargon, so for those of you who are not familiar, uh, please feel free to interrupt me um, anytime. And I don't know whether I will be able to carry out to the very end, but it doesn't matter. What I want to show you is a way to look at Drosophila and a way to use Drosophila as a model. Um, so uh, this is the title of the talk, and uh, this is what is left for my initial presentation. So why Drosophila? Uh, because it's a simple genome and body organization. Because 75% uh, of the genes associated with disease in humans are already present in Drosophila. Uh, it has a very short <coughs> cycle, and the genome is totally sequenced and thoroughly annotated. And of course, it's a very simple uh, genome, only four chromosomes, as compared to R46. And then we have a very um, easy way to build transgenic lines, which makes our life very easy, uh, with very limited ethical consideration compared to mice. Um, for those who use mice, they know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And financial consideration as well, which uh, those these days is not uh, um, uh, it's an important issue. We have a wide toolbox of gene reporters, uh, muta mutation, uh, RNAi, transgenic lines, gain of function in conditional manner. And of course, we can do a lot of in vivo analysis and manipulation. I left some movies at the very end in case I'm able to make it through. So this is what I'm going to talk about. So before we enter this, I will going to talk about, introduce what the BIA is and uh, what histone are in a very short manner. So this is um, a, ventral, a segment of the ventral cord of Drosophila, which is equivalent of our spinal cord, which I have, well, not me, my daughter was labeled uh, um, by immunostochemistry, uh, to light up the glial cells, which are uh, fed uh, via uh, the cell population. Here are the glial cells all around the neurons. Uh, different types of the cells in green here. They are all enwrapping the neuronal bodies, enwrapping the nerves, etc. And we also have in blue the neurons. And here are chemocytes, and I will come back to that perhaps tomorrow, um, which are also very important for curation in neurodegeneration. And so if we can have the rotation, you will notice how the ventral cord is organized, and you will see that. Uh, in flies, the hemocytes are not within the ventral cord. So this means that the glial cells um, are the macrophages, the macrophages that eat up all the cellular debris, that um, cell bodies, dying cells or injured cells, or if we need to have a, a reshuffling and remodeling of the nervous system, the glial cells are the ones that are going to make it. Whereas the hemocytes are sent each other, um, around the nervous system, but they not get into the nervous system. So basically, the glial cells play the role of vertebrate microbia, are cells that, again, eat up dead cell bodies and eat your cells in our nervous system. So, um, so glia are the cells we are interested in. And now chromatin is what we're going to look at. So this is a typical view of chromatin. This is a chromosome. And then if you look at the chromosome, then you can see the DNA fiber, which is wrapping the histone molecules, which are structural proteins. And what is taught is that when the histones are compact around um, wrapping, um, the DNA is wrapping the chromosome in a very compact manner, this bit of DNA will be unaccessible for transcription. Whereas if you have a relaxed chromatin with the nucleosomes here, which are sparse, uh, in that case, you have accessibility from 
transcription factors that will be able to bind here and to induce different events. This is a very simplified picture. And then, in fact, when we look at the nucleosomes in a more detailed manner, these are the nucleosomes, the DNA fiber, with all the octamers of histones, histone 3, histone 2, histone 2, histone 4, you will notice that each of these histone tails, which is uh, not within the nucleosome, but exiting the nucleosome, uh, they are all modified on many different sites and many different modifications. I'm only spotting three of them, a uh, few of them, like uh, phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation, and the same residue can be uh, either acetylated or methylated or even phosphorylated. So we have a broad picture of, uh, of huge number of modifications that are taking place in these histone proteins, which are structural processes of the nucleosome, which are important to provide compactness to the protein. This histone code is fantastic, but it's like a nothing. So we really do not know what all these modifications are doing, uh, what they are relevant for. And of course, if we have one modification here, it may be combined with any other of these other modifications. So it's very hard to understand the specific role of the different histone modification to a diverse uh, phenomena. And so, uh, in general, what is thought is that they are necessary to provide high level uh, modification of the chromatin structure. And the very simple view is that compact chromatin, no transcription, relaxed chromatin, transcription. But that is not all. There are many other things that happen, in fact. And this is what is more difficult to access. One thing that has been established quite clearly is that if we go from non-differentiated cells, so these cells are multipotent, they can provide different phase, specifically, for example, in the embryonic stem cells. Uh, these cells, as I said, they have a very relaxed chromatin state. And in this case, you have lots of transcription, which is somehow not very specific. These cells are very plastic in nature. But as soon as the cells are differentiated, then we start seeing compactness in some regions. And these will be the silent regions, the regions in which transcription does not take place, as compared to these other places where transcription does take place. So we go from <clears throat> a very relaxed uh, chromatin state to a rather compact chromatin state. That we know. That is relatively simple. We know that if we go from a multipotent plastic cell to differentiate the cell, the chromatin will be more and more compact. <clears throat> what is much less clear is what happens here, where we have different types of cells. Each of them must accomplish different tasks. Um, blood cells must carry uh, growing, other roles in immunity, epithelial cells have to, have to defend ourselves, these are necessary for contraction, nerve cells are necessary to you know, transmit the signal. They are very different tasks. And they may respond to very different uh, uh, challenges, typically the immune challenge, mechanical challenge, which would be very, very different. So transcription in nature is not an on and off uh, phenomenon. It can be made modulated and modulated in many, many, many ways. So saying compact and relaxed doesn't mean much, uh, especially in these cells. So the current view has been that if you have a cell A, say the blood cells, for example, there will be a specific transcription factor that will be accessible because the chromatin will be relaxed. One clear example of relaxation is acetylation in a specific residue of the histone 3 uh, molecule. And in that case, because the chromatin is relaxed in gene A, this will be expressed. In contrast, <coughs> in the cell, in the blood cells, the gene B, which is specific for cell B, will be in a compact configuration, and in this way, it will not be expressed. This is a very simple, again, simple-minded uh, hypothesis. So the idea was, okay, we have a different distribution 
of uh, relaxed and compact chromatin. In this way, we would expect that the different modifications with simply of the histones, uh, modifications that are necessary for transcription, for example, will be simply distributed in a different way. So geographically, in, a, in different cells, acetylation, which is a mark of initiation of transcription, will be deposited on some genes and not in others. But overall, you expect that this mark will be quantitatively the same between the two cells. So we have been focusing on specific... Uh, can I go back? Oh, 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 oh. We have been focusing specifically on this residue, uh, which has been associated with uh, transcription, H3K9 acetylation, but not only. And another residue, which instead is always been associated with um, transcription, which is the methylation of the histone three tail at position four, lies in four. And you will see why. So this is the first hypothesis, simply different geographical distribution of the chromatin modification, depending on the cell type, in differentiated cells. Again, I'm talking about differentiated cells. I'm not talking about cells which are developing and they're starting to acquire specific traits. What really happens when the cells have to accomplish its own function. Fact is that when we, uh, we looked at uh, the nervous system, and that, uh, as a matter of fact, this was a control for a different experiment. We didn't expect at all this. Uh, we went with the immunohistochemistry in the ventral core of a differentiated embryo prosophila with the H3K9 acetylation, which, remember, is generally associated with transcription, but not only. This is immunohistochemistry on the ventral core of the differentiated embryo. You will see that there are some cells which are highly expressing this mark and cells which are very poorly expressing this mark. I mean, these are cells. Now we know that there are bidapi. There are nuclei there, so it's not an empty space. Now, if we do, we look at the same image by using markers for specific cells in neurons. We have the glia, sorry, in green we have the neurons, and in blue we have the glia. You will see that the highly expressing um, H3K9 acetylation are the neurons. And the cells that have very poor levels of H3K9 acetylation are the glial cells. So this was totally unexpected. We, we expected only to be, as I said, this mark differentially distributed in the chromatin, but not that it would be quantitatively different in the two, between the two cells. And that was extremely puzzling to us. And so the first question, uh, that I will receive, but well, of course, this is because the glial cells, uh, you cannot really quantify this by immunohistochemistry. So we went through a CMI quantitative uh, analysis, we confirmed that by immunohistochemistry, and then we decided to take cells, fax them, sort them out, purify this population, that we could really have a homogeneous population. So we sorted either glia or neurons, and we then looked up by Western block now, in a quantitative manner, are the levels of uh, H3K9 acetylation. By Western blot, of course, we have here uh, a control, which H H2B, another histone, which is relatively stable. And you can see that there is a, a quite a bit difference between uh, the glial cells and the neurons. So this was quite clear to us, that we do have a quantitative difference in the levels of acetylation of this residue. The second question we received, yeah, yeah, but this, I mean, maybe this is typical for all the histone tails. You look at any other residue, we find the same. Just look at something which is really specific for uh, transcription and tell us whether that is also different between neurons and glia, because it could be that glial cells are simply, simply silent cells. Cells that compared to neurons are. Um, less prone to transcribe. I mean, the neurobiologists always thought of cells, glial cells, as being the Cinderella of the nervous system, uh, because these cells are not the ones that do things, uh, except that if you don't have glia, you don't survive. If you don't have glia, no, you will not be able to transmit the signal. 
Imagine that a sciatic nerve without glia will not be able to stand up because the myelin is what allows you uh, to uh, allows the neurons to send the signal and uh, to maintain this directing signal throughout its length. I mean, the, the sciatic nerve, uh, even for people who are not very tall, is you know, more than one meter. So you need the glial cells. So absolutely not true that the glial cells could be simply passive cells that are not able to transcribe. And to demonstrate that, what we did was to look at the, the classical marker for transcription, which is this modification of H3K4 3 methylation. So the methylation of lysine 4 on the histone 3 tail. That is taken as the real readout of transcription. Then again, we sorted the real cells, we sorted the neurons, and Quite nicely, we see that the same levels are there. So it's not that real cells are transcriptional sites. We need to go and explain this in a different way. So how do we do that? We have three questions. I don't know whether we'll be able to carry out through the three questions, but it doesn't matter. It's just to show what we can do in Drosophila to address this question. And one thing that I would like to uh, uh, recall you is that although this is not directly linked to what I'm going to tell you is not directed into the generation, it is obvious that one of the major targets in neurodegeneration is chromatin and epigenetic phenomena uh, that are really involved when mutant in, in uh, neurogenetic uh, processes. So what, the first question was, what is the profile of H3K9 acetylation in glia? Is it possible that all the genes are simply less acetylated in glia as compared to neurons, or are specific genes uh, that, are that are acetylated as compared to others which are not acetylated. So are there lower levels genome-wide or are there fewer genes that are acetylated in India as compared to neurons? The second question we wanted to address is whether this uh, phenomenon corresponds to anything and correlates, for example, with high transcription levels or different Mm, uh, modes of transcription as compared to on and off yes and no. And then what is um, uh, the enzyme that controls H3K9 acetylation? What histone uh, acetyl transferase is involved in this process? So to answer this question, we have to go the hard way. So to isolate nuclei from the and from neurons from the from the areas, uh, which we could do by using specific antibodies that we call glial neurons or glial cells. This is a lot of material that we have to isolate. And then uh, we extracted the chromatin. We immunoprecipitated with an antibody against the H3K9 acetylated residue, which are commercially available. And then we went for sequencing, and then we started with the whole bioinformatic analysis. So we went through uh, the raw data, the quality control, we map to the genome the different acetylated sites, we identify the peaks of acetylation, we then visualize the peaks on the genome, and then we went through the annotation, and then of course we try to identify familiar genes that would be sharing this uh, feature. So this is what we came up with. So we compare the um, number of genes that are this H3K9 acetylation feature in the uh, locus. And it, comes, uh, it turns out that there are many fewer genes that are acetylated in glia than in neurons. So the vast majority of the uh, genes in neurons are acetylated, but only one third is acetylated in glia, and some of them are shared. So this was to answer the first question. We have fewer genes that are acetylated in glia. But then the question was, how do we tackle? How do we analyze yes, these genes, and how do we understand what this means to the cell? So what we did, we plotted. Um, the level of acetylation in the different genes in glia and in neurons. And this is what we found. There are genes which are, um, 
higher satiety in glia, but not in noodles. Vice versa, genes which are um, only acetylated in noodles, but not in glia. And we have a, um, a very um, typical organization of the H3K9 profile. So how do we analyze these genes? So we did different things, because we, we, we couldn't figure out very easily what was going on. And the tools, the bioinformatic tools that are available, are not uh, very um, up to date in this respect. So we did this. We asked, for example, who are these genes which are not acetylated in glia, and who are these genes which are not acetylated in noodles? Can we identify specific family of genes that would tell us what is happening to those genes? And we couldn't find anything, anything relevant. Nothing was really popping up. Uh, when we said, well, maybe what we should do is to look at the genes which are highly acetylated in glia and in noodles and see whether they look, they, they provide us with some information. And that was a very nice surprise. So when we look at these genes, um, we looked at the family of genes by looking at the geo, uh, the group of G, family of genes to the geo analysis. And what we came up with was something that uh, is very satisfactory for the simple reason that uh, it identifies genes that are necessary for axon biology and neuro, you know, axon processes like dendrite morphogenesis, axon guidance, axon extension. These are the most significant groups of genes. And the, the p-value is very, very low. That, that never happened when we analyzed other groups of genes. The p-value uh, p was extremely high, so it was not significant. So this, the fact that in this specific class of genes, we identify GOs that are very relevant to neuronal uh, development to, is absolutely satisfactory. Now you will tell me, how come that in glia you find genes that are necessary in neurons? Fair enough. It's not that we don't find glia genes. They are. They are less uh, prominent, but they are there. I only take here the most relevant ones. But you have to remember that glia and neurons go hand in hand. Glia don't survive without neurons and vice versa. And as a matter of fact, uh, if you have no glia, there will be no axonal extension. And there are, uh, in glia says, a number of genes that are expressed uh, and that are necessary for uh, axonal extension, and typically cell adhesion molecules. And in fact, Amongst these genes, we have a lot of cell adhesion molecules. So we did find these genes, and that was uh, very nice. Uh, I won't show you, but take it for granted. Uh, believe me, we've done, we've done the same analysis, and we have analyzed uh, the genes that are high in uh, acetylated in neurons, and there are also this type of genes, axonal navigation. So we have here a class of genes which has a specific chromatin map, and which is associated with a, a process which is really important for the homeostasis between neurons and glia. And that comes up specifically uh, by using this uh, um, bioinformatic analysis. That was all nice, uh, but then we wanted to know, well, um, how does this correlate with transcription? And so what we did was to use, again, a genome-wide analysis. And what we did, we did lots of neurons, but I'm only going to show glia. We collected embryos in which we have a transgenic uh, plasmid inserted and uh, allows us to recognize the glia cells by the GFP expression. So we separated these uh, GFP cells. We isolated these cells. We fat sold them using the GFP. We extracted the RNA, uh, again, the Lumina sequencing, and again, the same type of analysis to look at uh, what gene has been fishing. We did the same analysis as before, and what we found is that um, now we are comparing transcription and this map, which is H3K9 acetylation. And what we find is that uh, uh, 
these are the genes which are transcribed in the cells, and these are the genes which are um, acetylated. When we look now at the genes that are highly expressed and highly acetylated, these are the genes which are here. Because in this plot we have the level of expression of the different genes and the level of acetylation. You will see that this is not a direct correlation. You can have genes which are very highly expressed and not acetylated at all. Very highly acetylated but not expressed at all. And again, if we do a GO analysis on these genes, we don't pull out, we don't pull out any gene which is really relevant to something which is specific to humans. We will get metabolism, metabolism, metabolism processes, but we won't get something which is specific for neuron and glia. And so again, we choose these genes which are highly expressed and highly acetylated, and we find the same genes that we found before. That these, that these axon guidance, uh, learning and memory, glia cells development, and if we go a little bit uh, lower, we also find synapse formation. And that is also very important because you all know that glia cells are absolutely fundamental for the maintenance and for the formation of the synapse. So this is to say that we have uh, lots of histone maps that we are really poor understanding of. And we, instead of, well, we need to have different ways to understand the role of these maps by looking at different cell types um, and also at different residues. I think what we have seen here with H3K9 acetylation is the tip of the iceberg, uh, meaning that I'm sure that if you were to take, I don't know, immune cells, you may have not H3K9 being necessary, but perhaps other residues that are being necessary. And the reason why I'm saying that is that if you look at uh, embryos here, look, this is an embryo of the Zofida, and this is the lava. I'm cheating here, because in reality, this is the embryo, and this is the lava. <laughs> and the reason why I'm saying that is that this is to show you uh, the structure of the nervous system, the central nervous system, and the peripheral nerves. And you see how this changes in the larvae, where the ventral cord is compressed, it's pretty much the same, very small, but huge nerves are coming out or getting into the ventral cord. And this uh, shows you how much growth, extensive and fast growth, uh, must take place for these axons to reach their destination. And again, this must be accompanied by the presence of glia. If I were to show a synapse, you wouldn't even be able to see a synapse in the embryo. But it's extremely elaborate, and you will see pictures, I'm sure, later on in the course, about this beautiful uh, neuromuscular synapses, uh, the neuromuscular junctions, which are the motor neurons and muscle synapses, extremely uh, elaborated, extremely large. That also has to go extensively during this time, which is few days. So perhaps, what we are now looking at here is a mark for a type of transcription that must be constantly on those genes. And it must be constantly on in these genes that have to be um, coordinated. So what we found, for example, as I said, we've done the same analysis on chip set and then a set on neurons, and we found the same family of genes. When I say family of genes, it means axon extension, axon growth. And we found, again, in both cell types, cerebellum molecules. However, uh, the cerebellum molecules that we found the mostly uh, represented is a family that contains 22 members. And these are necessary for heterotypic interaction. And interestingly enough, within the same family, some members are expressed are uh, highly acetylated and highly expressed in neurons, and some in glia. So that could mean, but this is, you know, 
uh, hypothesis is that you need to have a coordinated expression of these genes that are necessary for cell addition that will allow this growth of the axon which is accompanied by the growth of the PSX. And only by doing so you can get a coordinated growth which must be fast and continuous over a long time. Perhaps if we were to look at a different type of transcription, say immune challenge, we would see another map being necessary to allow those genes to respond properly. And this means that we have to look into this histone code in a different way. So perhaps different histone maps are going to uh, mark different modes of transcription. And this is something that we need to understand uh, to really uh, get into you know, this entangle, this <coughs> huge atlas of information <coughs> that we dispose of. Um, now, how is H3K9 acetylation regulated? So we know that there are a lot of enzymes that are um, there to promote acetylation, remove acetylation. And in fact, uh, this has been already shown that uh, uh, in invertebrates there are some uh, histone acetylase has or histone deacetylase h dust that are specific to glia. Uh, one of them is CBP. And so what we did was um, to do, first of all, a very rough analysis. And we asked, is CBP expressed in neurons and in glia? And if so, uh, if it has to acetylate this residue, which is H3K9, and we know that H3K9 acetylation is low in glia high in neurons, is it possible that CBP is also low in glia high in neurons? I won't show you the data, but believe me, that is the case. So having seen that there is a quantitative difference in CBP between neurons and glia, then we went on and said, OK, can we uh, modify the expression of CBP, and in vivo see whether that affects acetylation. So what we can do in Drosophila, as you all know, we can get this uh, um, overexpression analysis by using the uis gap system. So we overexpress CBP in all the neurons, and we checked at the levels of H3K9 acetylation compared to the wild type. This is the CBP immunosochemistry in a wild type and the levels of acetylation. We overexpress CBP, and we see an increase of acetylation. We even went further, so we use a transgenic reporter that expresses the CBP, but it is totally dead, so it cannot acetylate anymore. And in that case, we didn't see any increase in acetylation. That was very satisfactory. Um, but we also did the reverse, so we eliminated CBP, and we also saw a decrease of um, acetylation at the H3K9 um, residue. That was uh, not expected at all, because people in general thought that CBP is not the most prominent uh, heart for this. There are other hearts that are assumed to work in this way. But this again says that maybe what we have been looking so far at is a, a very on and off. Uh, but when we look at specific processes, maybe the hearts will behave in a different way. And the other experiment that we did was a very good experiment. Uh, we used this gain of function experiment in which we overexpress CBP specifically in glia. And we ask, are we doing something? So remember, <coughs> the cells have low levels of CBP, low level of H3K9 acetylation. So if you now higher the levels of CBP, and therefore you higher the level of acetylation, you expect to have a detrimental effect. So we did a very crude assay, and this is very preliminary. Um, we stay, we, we immunolabel the ventral cord of the embryo. This is a part of the ventral cord. And we uh, label this with um, a marker which is called NASCUD, which is specific to, for the longitudinal glial cells, a subset of glial cells. And when we overexpress CBP in these cells, um, 
as if we see a total disruption of the profile. So we are doing something which is detrimental to the cell. And this is to say that the cell has to have low level of CBP, has to have uh, low levels of HTK and anesthesia, otherwise it won't be able to function properly. So uh, what I would like to leave you today with is the following. So we, we, we can now, uh, by using the genome-wide analysis, the in vivo analysis combined with genetics, uh, combined on with all the tools that we dispose of, we can now really assess the role of chromatin um, state and set function, and not only chromatin state and development. Um, we also uh, think that this might be relevant not only for axon biology, but in different cell types, uh, maybe other marks will be important. And of course, this is not to say that the only mark that is necessary is H3K9 acetylation. Absolutely not. We have some other evidence that other marks might be also relevant. And that will help us understand what a histone code really means to the cell uh, in vivo and in the whole organism. Uh, so we have some evidence that CDP histone acetyl transfer is controls H3K9 acetylation. This is not to say that this is the only hack. And of course, if we have the histone acetylase, uh, most likely we will have also h tax that is histone deacetylases, that will be equally important. Uh, because this is always a balance between acetylation and deacetylation. So if CBP is at work, most likely h tax will also be important specifically in real cells. So, so what we're doing is to do the same analysis that I have shown today with uh, histone deacetylases that we can uh, look at both in vivo and also in, uh, by uh, chipset. Um, so what we would like to see is now we can play with these levels of histone modification. We can ask, okay, what if I, uh, for example, specifically modify um, the levels of HTK9 acetylation. We also have mimics of HTK9 acetylation transgenes. What happens? Do we really find what we expect is, for example, is that in those cases where you have altered the levels of this uh, residue, you will end up with uh, uh, uncoordinated axon growth, uncoordinated uh, um, synapse development of function. And this is exactly what we can now do. We specifically alter the levels of CDP or H3K9 acetylation in LIA, and we can see whether this will distract synaptic uh, function or axon approach. And we can do the same in, in you know, so we can lower the level of CDP, we can lower the level of H3K9, and see whether that will uh, distract the homeostasis between humans and LIA. Um, and I think this is. Uh, to, to show how we can uh, tackle epigenetics from a very different standpoint, which is not only uh, by looking at geographical distribution, but also at uh, specific processes associated with specific uh, epigenetic maps. So these are the people that have contributed to the work. Actually, this is uh, mostly been done by a master's <coughs> student who is now into uh, the first year of the PhD, she's coming from Lebanon. Um, Pierre has done a lot of bioinformatics in this, and uh, Pierre Catneau is a um, scientist, is a staff uh, member of the group. Yoshi is just left. He has been working on the vertebrate uh, via cells through a pathway that we have been looking at uh, um, in flies for many years. Wael has been looking at the role of uh, um, immune cells in flies. I will allude to that tomorrow. Uh, Alexia is a Greek student. Um, she's working again in vertebrates. Archit Bagul is an Indian student who just joined us. And he's looking at the role of uh, the immune system in uh, um, crosstalk with the nervous system. And this is why today in the practical we will look at uh, uh, the importance of uh, phagocytic events in the hemocytes. 
uh, Celine and Claude are, are technicians. Um, I mean, <laughs> as in all groups, I believe things evolve very fast. So some people are not there, some people are no longer there. <laughs> so, uh, this was possible through the help of the IGVMC facilities and flight community, and these are collaborators, and these are the funding bodies that have been trusting us. Now, I would just like to show you a couple of movies to show you what we can really do uh, in vivo. Uh, because when we look at migration, in many cases we look at migration in cells, uh, which is satisfactory to some extent, but then if we look now and cells that are in a body, then you can really see how uh, glial cells in particular move and how elaborated these cells are while they move. So this is again to show that we can, in Drosophila, uh, when we look at the in vivo events, uh, it's really by time lapse, uh, focuses on processes as they happen in the whole animal. And by saying that, I think I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.